The American Civil War saw the debut of many new military technologies that would completely change how wars were fought thereafter. The Gatling gun, invented in 1861, was the first fully developed rotary cannon and was a precursor to the machine guns that were used for devastating effect in both World War I and World War II. Additionally, the Civil War was among the first conflicts to employ aircraft in the form of hot air balloons for aerial reconnaissance. Hot air balloons would later evolve into the dirigibles that terrified the citizens of London in the First World War. The most clearly understood advantage at the time, however, was with the use of ironclads and submarines in naval warfare. Ironclads outclassed every ship that came before them and, as a result, caused the largest change in both ship design and naval tactics that the world had ever seen. The use of steam power in the early 1800s facilitated more massive ships that could operate independently of the wind and made exclusive sail power now obsolete. The use of the newly invented explosive shell also made the previously unstoppable ships of the line very vulnerable. This vulnerability made stronger hulls a necessity for newly made ships. This rock-paper-scissors style of ship design led Europe to develop the first ironclad warships. However, they merely added iron plating to the hulls of conventional warships and didn't make any radical changes besides this. These ironclad designs were mainly used as a deterrent and never had a chance to participate in war. However, in America things were different. During the Civil War, the North had a significant industrial advantage over the South and, as a result, had a much better navy. The Confederacy didn't have any combat-ready ships by the time the war began. They realized that, even if they could produce conventional warships at the same rate as the Union, they would still have a major disadvantage because of the North's head start. So, in an attempt to stand a chance against the Union's numbers despite their limited industry, the Confederacy strove for quality over quantity for their ships. Because of this, they were drawn to the idea of ironclad warships, and subsequently were the first side to employ them during the Civil War. The USS Manassas was the first ironclad of the war, completed September 12, 1861. It was a heavily modified icebreaking ship that was converted into a ram. The Manassas had participated in two battles, but didn't have substantial impact in either one. The speed at which she moved combined with her low number of guns made her not particularly lethal in combat. The CSS Manassas was lost several months after she was commissioned at the Battle of Forts Jackson and St. Philip. Ultimately, her influence wasn't particularly noteworthy to anyone at the time. It was a different story with the Confederacy's other attempts, however. Soon after Virginia seceded, Union troops were forced to scuttle the Merrimack at the shipyard in Norfolk in response to the approaching Confederate rebels. However, Union troops were only able to destroy the masts and top deck before it sank. After taking Norfolk, the Confederacy took advantage of the Merrimack's incomplete destruction. The Confederacy continued with their habit of repurposing old ships and, like a nautical Dr. Frankenstein, brought the Merrimack back from the dead. The additions they would make would make the ship unrecognizable. The newly named CSS Virginia sported ten cannons, an armored casemate, and a ram like Manassas. Because of the thickness and angle of its armor, it became a near-unstoppable floating fortress. This ship posed a significant threat to the Union's navy. The Union got wind of the construction of the CSS Virginia early on. Realizing the potential threat that the new ironclad posed, the Union began to consider building their own. The Navy employed famous Swedish inventor John Ericsson for the creation of their ironclad. Ericsson was very forward-thinking, and had pushed for a new and highly experimental design. His ship would be entirely steam-driven and feature the revolutionary addition of a rotating turret armed with two Dahlgren guns. It was the first the world had seen of its kind. This radical departure from traditional ship design wasn't without its controversy, but despite this, the government approved of Ericsson's idea. Ericsson's ship, dubbed the USS Monitor, had only taken 118 days to launch. However, much of the focus the Monitor received from the press during its development was very critical. It was designed with the goal of rivaling the CSS Virginia, but its highly experimental nature and short development time made the ship seem like a significant gamble. Yet this gamble was very necessary if the Union was to have a competing ironclad in time. While it didn't immediately sink like someone expected or hoped, it did have some issues with steering and engine power. 
Because of the Confederacy's head start, the Virginia was nearing completion, so the Monitor's testing phase was somewhat rushed. The moment Erickson finished testing the Monitor, it was sent south to Virginia in hopes of preempting the Confederacy's ironclad. However, the Confederacy had just finished the CSS Virginia at the time and sent it to Hampton Roads to destroy the Union blockade that was blocking Confederate supplies from reaching ports inland. From the moment of its arrival on May 8th, the Virginia was nearly unstoppable despite being incredibly outnumbered by Union ships. It rammed and subsequently sank the USS Cumberland, ran both the USS Congress and Minnesota aground, which caused the steam frigate St. Lawrence and Roanoke to retreat. The day had been a real victory for the Confederacy as they were able to inflict over 280 Union casualties and extensive damages while only suffering trivial damage to their own ship. The Virginia did have to temporarily withdraw as the ship's deep draft was incompatible with low tides. The U.S.'s Navy had never seen a defeat this bad before. Large crowds of civilians and sailors watched this battle unfold. Even more were present the next day. Because so much was riding on this battle, people thought that it would possibly determine the outcome of the war. The morning of the next day, the Virginia came back to finish what it had started. However, this time, things wouldn't go as smoothly for the Confederacy. The Union's ironclad, the USS Monitor, had arrived to reinforce the fleet. Aside from being equally well armored, the Monitor was much smaller and its turret was the only part substantially above the water and able to be hit. Additionally, it was more maneuverable due to its more advanced engines and smaller size. Its turret only compounded this advantage. However, despite all of the advantages that it had, it lacked the firepower to really damage the Virginia and vice versa. This led to a long and intense battle that lasted almost four hours. Neither ship sustained anything more than minor damages. Because of the perceived invincibility of their respective designs, both armies viewed the outcome as a victory. The Battle of Hampton Roads was significant in establishing the reputation that ironclads had. It demonstrated without a doubt that ironclads were far superior to conventional wooden warships in terms of effectiveness. Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote about the event. The last gun of the Cumberland, when a deck was half submerged, sounded the requiem of many sinking ships. Then went down all the navies in Europe. In the months that followed, both the Confederacy and the Union lost their respective ironclads. The Confederacy scuttled the Virginia for the second and final time, and the Union's monitor was lost at sea. But, because of the promise the ironclads had, both sides continued pursuing their respective designs. The South made more ships inspired by the success of the Virginia, like the CSS Texas or the CSS Tennessee, which were both low-down river boats with slanted metal casemates. The Union was also inspired by this design and made many similar gunboats for their navy. Because of their greater industry, they were able to make more complicated designs as well. They continued to develop more advanced monitor-class ships under the design of Ericsson. While the Confederacy had been the first to use ironclads, the Union quickly followed with the production of theirs and maintained naval superiority for the rest of the war. Because of their comparatively low amount of ironclads, the South had to rely on many refitted civilian ships to make up for the disparity between navies. These ships were often woefully under-armored and undergunned. During the Battle of Memphis on June 6, 1862, the Confederate naval forces were composed of eight minimally armed trade ships that came up against five Union ironclads accompanied by two rams heading down the Mississippi River to assault Vicksburg. In a very odd move, the Confederacy used their surplus of cotton to their advantage and had loaded their ships to the brim with bales of it as makeshift armor. The strategy of these amusingly named cottonclads was to use the cotton to allow it to survive long enough to get within close range of the enemy ship. Unsurprisingly, this wasn't a viable tactic, and the battle ended with a Union victory, with seven out of the eight Confederate cottonclads being knocked out, while only one Union ram was damaged significantly. The Union's use of ironclads provided invaluable aid in many battles and enabled them to take over the Mississippi River. They played a large part in the Battle of Fort Hindman, 
where they suppressed the fort's defenders and allowed the infantry to advance and take the fort. Additionally, they were part of the Vicksburg Campaign and acted as nearly indestructible support for the combined arms efforts used in the campaign. The victory here was a turning point in the war as the Confederacy lost almost all control of the Mississippi River. Because they still required an edge to fight the Union's navy in any capacity, the Confederacy began experimenting with submersible technology. Both sides had experimented with this technology, but the Confederacy was the only one that really pursued it to any meaningful end. The CSS Pioneer, created by Horace Lawson Hunley, was the first attempt at one of these vessels. It didn't see any combat, however, as it had to be scuttled to prevent capture from the Union forces. After their next submarine design, the American Diver, sank in rough waters, the Confederacy created the first somewhat successful submarine, the H.L. Hunley, in 1863, named after its creator. The Hunley was the first submarine to ever sink any vessel when it attacked the USS Housatonic. It was armed with what was essentially an explosive charge attached to a long pole to damage enemy vessels. This charge was likely too powerful for the Hunley to withstand, as it was lost during the attack. However, the cause of its untimely end isn't fully known. While relatively few Americans were able to witness their battles in person, many soldiers and citizens alike knew the reputation that ironclads had because of these battles. Due to their unfamiliarity with the new technology, the public had both fears of the enemy's ships and doubts of their own. Ironclads often determined which side would win a naval engagement, and so, they had countless indirect effects as a result of the battles that they had won. They were also instrumental in blocking crucial resources to the opposing side. The tactical advantages that they gave determined the outcome of the war, and so played a large part in everyone's lives because of it. While the first appearance of ironclads was in Europe, it took their use in the American Civil War to get the world to realize their potential. The designs used by America were also revolutionary for their time and inspired many other countries to design similar ships. The first European ironclads were very similar to the ships that came before them in terms of capabilities, barring the added steam power and iron plates on the hull. Comparatively, the American designs were near complete departures from traditional ship designs of the time and were more capable as a result, temporarily setting us apart from the rest of the world. I would have been both excited and scared by the concept of ironclads. The complexity of the inner workings of the Monitor and similar ships were remarkable, and I would no doubt be interested in their design. However, the huge leap in military power that they brought would be worrisome to me. As someone who often ponders the future, I would wonder what advancements would follow ironclads and what would happen as more nations got a hold of this technology. These fears would be realized in the wars during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. After the Civil War, the US continued to develop more Monitor class ships. Over time, these would begin to look more and more like traditional battleship designs that we are familiar with today. In 1906, the HMS Dreadnought would incite another leap in ship design, with its almost exclusive use of large caliber guns. And, like the Monitor, the Dreadnought's name would be used to define an entire new class of ships inspired by its design. Dreadnoughts would lead to battleships, and later the warships of today. Submarines similarly continued development as time went on. They played a large part in World War I and World War II in the form of German U-boats, and reached potential world-ending power with the addition of onboard nuclear weapons during the Cold War. I had previously known the superficial details of the Battle of Hampton Roads and the fight between the CSS Virginia and the USS Monitor, however the background of and the effects following the battle were new to me. Additionally, I was unaware of the vast number of other ironclads that participated in the war. I was also previously unaware of the disparity in naval power throughout the war. My favorite bit of new information was regarding the cottonclads. I'd previously not known anything about them, and I find their name quite amusing. Ironclads, submarines, and other emergent technologies saw their first practical use in the Civil War. They shaped many of the events that occurred in the war, and were the beginning of many technologies that would continue to shape wars after. While many of these technologies were comparatively primitive to what preceded them, 
They were still very important in the history of warfare and are one of the main reasons why the American Civil War is considered by many to be the first modern war.